welcome. It's lovely to see so many of you here uh, this afternoon. It's a beautiful snowy afternoon in Sherburne, Holliston and Natick. So a lovely time to, to tune in uh, to a program here on, on your computer. Uh, my name is Nikki Lefebvre and I am the director of the Natick Historical Society. And um, today I am joined by um, some cherished and wonderful neighbors uh, in, uh, from the Sherburne Historical Society, the Holliston Historical Society, uh, and the Sherburne Library. Um, and it's, it's just really great to be in such wonderful company. Um, and we've had a lot of fun uh, working on this project together. Um, this program, Along the Indifferent Road with George Washington, is a special one. Uh, not only because it brings us back to an important moment in our shared history, but also because it brings all of us together across town boundaries and really encourages us, encourages us to look anew at the familiar roads and structures that we pass by uh, every day. Um, and so without further ado, we're grateful to have three speakers with us this afternoon. And in order of speaking, I want to welcome Terry Evans of the Natick Historical Society. Terry has lived in Natick for 26 years and has served on the board of the Natick Historical Society uh, since 2010. She has too many favorite landmarks in Natick to count, but the Bacon Free Library, also home to the Natick Historical Society, is high on her list. When she's not studying Natick's past, you can find her shamelessly hawking books and raising money for the Friends of the Morse Institute Library or giving architectural tours in the city of Boston. I also want to welcome Betsy Johnson from the Sherburne Historical Society. Betsy is a proud townie, born in Sherburne in 1939. She joined the board of the Sherburne Historical Society in 1986 for a one year term. Now that appointment has turned into a 36 year term and she's still going strong. Her favorite Sherburne landmark is the Twitchell House on Pleasant Street. And when she's not deeply engaged in studying Sherburne's past, you can probably find her outside working in her yard or reading a history book, perhaps something beyond Sherburne. Um, and finally, a, a warm welcome to Joanne Holbert of the Holliston Historical Society. Another proud townie, Joanne has lived in Holliston all her life and she joined the Historical Society uh, there in Holliston in 1976. Her favorite landmark in her town is the Eight Arch Bridge. And when she's not studying Holliston's past, you'll find her reading up on baseball history. She's always thinking about what the Red Sox are doing, even in the off season, and I think even on quite snowy afternoons like today. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, the fall of 1789 was a defining period for George Washington, the first man to hold the title of President of the United States, as set forth in a constitution that was just two years old. Six months after his inauguration in New York on April 30th, he made plans to introduce himself to the citizens of the country that he was now charged with leading. This visit to New England was the first of a series of trips that he would make as president. And to understand just how young the country was, it's worth noting that he did not include Rhode Island on this journey because New England's smallest state had not yet ratified the constitution. Washington left New York for Boston on October 15th on a nine day journey with many stops on the way. While en route, he was advised of plans for a parade to mark his arrival in Boston on October 24th. For the occasion, architect Charles Bullfinch was awarded his first commission to design a temporary structure for, of a triumphal arch that spanned Corn Hill, present day Washington Street at the old state house. After five busy days, Washington left Boston on October 29th and headed north to New Hampshire. He planned to visit Vermont and return to New York via Albany, but a heavy snowfall around Albany on November 3rd and urgent affairs to attend to at home changed his plans. Instead, he decided to return to New York City via Massachusetts. He noted in his diary um, that he was disappointed by the weather and bad roads of central Massachusetts from his journey north. With the unexpected change of plans, we come to see that his, it, there doesn't appear to have been any organized celebration of events or events to welcome him for the return to New York. He was apparently disappointed in the road that he was advised to take, uh, called the most direct road to New York, which would lead him through Natick, 
Sherburne and Holliston. He noted in his diary that, quote, upon the whole, it may be called an indifferent road. Washington was traveling in a carriage pulled by a team of four horses with his secretaries Tobias Lear and William Jackson riding horses on either side. Behind him was a baggage wagon and driver. He was accompanied by six service, servants, at least two of whom were enslaved. Giles in Paris, one of the two enslaved men would have ridden last, leading Washington's white charger, Prescott. He left Watertown on the morning of November 6th and headed southwest along much of we now think of today as Route 16. In many of the communities he passed through from Watertown to New York, the route was named Washington Street in his honor. Now let's trace President Washington's route through Natick, Sherburne, and Holliston, and explore where he traveled, what he did, and what buildings and landmarks stand today as silent witnesses to his journey. Welcome to Natick. Washington's diaries, I should hasten to note, make no mention of Natick in his journey. He would have arrived from Watertown very early in the morning. He was known to set out before dawn. Entering the town from what was then Needham, now Wellesley, and the old Hartford Road, present day Elliott Street, a few hundred yards to the east of the current town boundary, which followed the shoreline of Lake Wabin. Eight years after his travels, that boundary line would shift west to its present location. Of the houses still standing today, this would have been the first that he would have passed in Natick. Originally built as a salt box by David Morse in 1759, it stood on land purchased from indigenous owners in 1730. Morse was one of Natick's first white settlers and it was the great grandson of Samuel Morse, one of the original planters of Dedham in 1636. In 1761, he deeded the house to his son. And then in 1779, Ephraim Dana bought the property, established a blacksmith shop at the corner of Leech Lane, which may have been operating when Washington passed. The property remained nominally in the Dana family for a hundred years and was sold to H. Hollis Hunnewell in 1876. At the time it was added to the um, National Register of Historic Places uh, as the Elliott Historic District, it was serving as a two family house for Hunnewell family staff. And today it's the home of the foundation for Metro West. The David Morse house at 21 Elliott Street was also built by David Morse. This was the first house he completed um, on his relocation here. He kept the town records for the native proprietors of Natick and built what was a one to two story salt box for his family. This house, uh, the original house probably originally resembled his son Pelatiah's 1748 Tavern, which we'll see in a moment, or the house we just visited at 3 Elliott Street. The Georgian structure that you see here today is thought to incorporate the original house within it. This house had 10 fireplaces and a funeral door. And the large structure that you see at the rear is recent. He would continue down Elliott Street, just a short stop to the Pelatiah Moore's Tavern. Uh, tradition holds that one acre of this property was a gift from the Praying Indians to John Elliott. In 1748, David Morse completed this uh, for his son, where it was going to serve as a residence tavern and stage stop on the old Hartford Road. It was the first tavern in Natick and the first of two that Washington would have driven by. In 1755, Pelatiah would have kind of expanded laterally in addition to the tavern and inn he acquired the grain fooling and sawmills at the Charles River Dam from the elder Hezekiah Broad. Pelatiah was a member of the Natick's Community of Correspondence, a wartime assembly that channeled news among Massachusetts towns as pre-war boycotts of British goods got underway. The tavern had been a designated meeting place for men who led Natick's participation in the revolution and the grounds were said to have been used for military drills. Like 3 Elliott Street, by the time this was added to the National Register, it was being used as a two-family house. And today, it's a centerpiece of the Riverbend Montessori School Campus. Coming now to what is today South Natick Square, the meeting house that George Washington would have passed here was the fourth to stand on the site, built in 1767. It is no longer extant. The current structure there was completed in 1828. 
but a few steps away is the South Natick Burying Ground, located on an acre of land given by Natick Praying Indians by unanimous town meeting vote to Reverend Oliver Peabody as a burying ground for English settlers. Reverend Peabody, David N. Pelletime Morse, and Reverend Stephen Badger, whose home we'll see in a moment, were among those buried there. After passing the church and the burying ground, the procession would have passed that second tavern, this one run by a man named Eliakim Morrill, and it's the white building that you see in the um, upper image, the prominent featuring pretty prominently. Today, that 1782 tavern is no longer standing. Um, it is the site of present day Shaw Park. So Eli oh yeah, ugh, Eliakim Morrill uh, was and his tavern were fictionalized by Harriet Beecher Stowe in her 1869 book, Old Town Folks. The inn was later acquired by Goan Bailey. It burned in the 1872 fire that destroyed much of South Natick Center um, and was rebuilt. It was then demolished 60 years later to create Shaw Park. Now the Stephen Badger house seen here, completed in 1753, is probably the best preserved of the buildings that Washington would have passed in Natick. The parsonage was built for Reverend Stephen Badger, the last missionary to the Prang Indians. And the house looks today very much as it was believed to look at the time, thanks to careful research and restoration in the 1950s. Long after Washington passed here, John Bacon would um, buy the house. His son Oliver and Oliver's wife Sarah lived here, and Sarah kept South Natick's first library in the home. On his death in 1878, Oliver left a bequest to construct a fireproof building to house the library and what was then called the South Natick Historical, Natural History, and Library Society Museum. Just west of the house is the site of the Friendship Elm and has a marker in the stone wall that stands there. In 1753, a delegation of Native Americans came to the Badger House bearing two elm trees as a token of their regard. A granite marker was set in the wall at the time to mark the site of one of the elms. Um, both would have been standing in 1789 when Washington passed by. And in fact, the second of the pair is said to have lasted into the 1950s. And the final house in Natick is the Jeremiah Bacon House. You see it today, it's now been painted white by its new owners. It was completed in 1752 and stands on land that was the ancestral estate of the Bacon family that first settled in the West Bank of the Charles. The house was built by housewright John Bacon, which is an, an earlier John Bacon than the one I just mentioned, on land he had acquired from Joshua Brand, who was described historically as an Indian planter. It was built as a simple 18th century farmhouse and the major renovations over the centuries still managed to retain the kind of original character uh, in its detail. In your mind's eye, you might have imagined Washington continuing to Sherburne along present day Route 16, passing the site of uh, present day Broadmoor, but that was not the case. The land there was low and marshy and roads were not, com were not completed over marshy land if there was a high land, high dry land to go on. So that stretch was not, to Sherburne was not completed until 1830. Instead, he would have very literally taken the high road following Everett Street, which was then called the County Road. And now I'll pass you to Betsy Johnson and Sherburne. Now we enter Sherburne. The Woodcock House, in this photo at the site of number 39 is the only one the Historical Society has of houses on Everett Street that might have been there when George Washington rode by. There were others, including a Douse house, but since then they have all burned or been torn down. The county road through Sherburne started on Everett Street and went along high land to avoid the swamp on both sides. Then it went along North Main Street, Washington Street, and through the town center and up the hill. Next, it turned off onto Greenwood, Woodland, Ash, and Hollis Streets to join Washington Street in East Holliston. The 21 milestone marks the mileage from Boston for the purposes of determining postage charges. When Benjamin Franklin was appointed Postmaster General, he had milestones like this one 
set up beginning in 1753. The plain burying ground, which is right across the street, had not yet been laid out. There was also a 22 mile stone near the railroad crossing at North Main Street, but it disappeared sometime about 1850. This sycamore tree and the ash behind it, opposite Douse's apple stand, are all that remain of the four trees, two ash and two sycamore, planted by Joseph Douse during or shortly after he returned from the Revolutionary War. Near it is a plaque documenting it. The rear two-story section of the Joseph Douse house at 100 North Main is the oldest part and where Joseph's family was living at the time of George Washington's trip. The Douse family had come to the Sherburn Holliston area from Charlestown in 1775 as refugees, the night before the Battle of Bunker Hill. As they anticipated, Charlestown, including their house there, was burned during the battle. The family lived first in a small house on Everett Street. They were leather workers, tanning skins in the wetlands between Everett and the present Elliott Streets. The back part of the Tapley Wyeth House at 46 North Main is the oldest part, dating to the early 1700s, and was part of an earlier Larned family home. The front part dates to about 1790. This section of Sherburn was part of the 4,000 acre land swap with the Natick Indians made in 1679. House lots like this one were allotted all along North Main Street shortly thereafter. As he drove along, George would have seen a series of 17th century houses, many with 18th century L's in the rear. In the 19th century, the owners replaced the earliest buildings with the then modern style house that we see, houses that we see now. The north side of the Whitney Paul house at 41 North Main Street, perhaps dates to the 1760s and was where the Honorable Daniel Whitney lived. He had been the major town leader during the Revolutionary War, holding seven town offices simultaneously. The large wing on the south side was not there yet. It was added about 1828 by Captain Daniel Paul to be a tavern, inn, and store. Colonel Bullard ran an inn and tavern here at 33 North Main Street, probably in his house, which may have been attached behind the present one. He had been a colonel in the 5th Middlesex Regiment that marched to Saratoga, New York, following the Battle of Bennington, and he was present at the surrender of British General Burgoyne. I wonder why George didn't stop here. But George did stop for a break and some food at Samuel Sanger's Tavern, located at the site of 3 North Main Street, opposite the Abbey Road development. Here, he supposedly drank tea from one of these cups and saucers. Notice that the cups have no handles. I've read that people poured the tea from the cup into the saucer to cool and then drank it from the saucer. The family cherished these. They were already antique in George's time and passed them down to descendants. But by now, no one knows which one George actually used. Sanger's Inn was a conglomerate of several buildings. The house of Reverend Gookin, the town's first minister, had been moved to it from near Cemetery Lane as an addition. The tavern was remembered for having 11 outside doors. Three of Samuel's sons had served in the Revolutionary War. The oldest burying ground in Sherburn is out South Main Street at Bullard Street near the area of First Settlement. This was the second one established in the town, but it contains the oldest extant gravestone dated 1689. There are many more burials here than there are gravestones and it originally extended south beyond Village Way. 
When George Washington rode through, it was also being used as a cow pasture by the Sagers. The L of Colonel Calvin Sanger's house, shown here, had been built for Reverend Samuel Locke, the fourth, fourth minister of the town. When he returned from being president of Harvard College, he set up a classical school, the equivalent of a high school. This L, built about 1775, served as a dormitory for his students, all male, and was attached to a gambrel roofed house that had been built for his predecessor, Reverend Porter. In the 1890s, the L was moved around the corner to 12 Maple Street, where it is currently a house. Colonel Sanger had the main block built in 1819. Across the street stood the predecessor of the current First Parish Church. Believe it or not, it was print, painted an orange color. Reverend Locke's successor, Reverend Elijah Brown, would have been living here at 22 Washington Street. The longest serving minister of First Parish Church, he was noted for grafting apples, for his humor, for his liberal religious views, and for his scandalously short 10 to 15 minute sermons during the winter. Remember, the meeting house had no heat. He also ran a classical school here. Ministers weren't paid much even then. This gap in the stone wall nearly opposite 31 Washington Street is part of an old major road that connected with, with South Main at Goulding Street, shown by the dotted line. It came up along Ivy Lane, crossed Sawin and Washington Streets, and continued to Green Lane and ultimately to Framingham. John Grout bought this farm at 42 Washington Street in 1760 from the Greenwood family, who then moved up the hill. The Grouts were blacksmiths as well as farmers. Four Grout sons served in the Revolutionary War. One helped make the great chain across the Hudson River near West Point that attempted to keep British ships from sailing upstream to destroy the New York capital at Kingston. The only current building that George Washington would have seen in passing is the small freestanding building most of the north shown by the arrow. Richard Sanger, one of the sons of tavern keeper Samuel, Samuel Sanger, bought the property at 60 Washington Street in 1735 from descendants of John Hull, mint master of the pine tree shillings, and Judge Samuel Sewell, and had a two-story gamble roofed house built in what was then the most modern style. Sometime later, it received two lean-to additions that clearly show up in a photo taken about 1890. Like probably all the houses in town when George came by, it was unpainted and remained so for at least another century. Called a salt box because of its shape, the Bull Phipps House was built in the first decade of the 1700s for William Bull. Tradition says that the roof was being re-shingled in 1775 and that the men working there could hear the booming of cannon from the Battle of Bunker Hill. Revolutionary War veteran Asa Sanger was living there when George Washington came by. According to the family, George stopped and chatted with Asa, who was out mending the stone wall in front of his house. For years, the county road hugged the hill with a wicked curve at the top. Because 20th century cars often came to grief coming down the hill the there, the county moved the roadbed down the slope to the present location in the early 1930s. You can still see the stone walls along both sides of the old section of road. In 1789, the hill was probably called either Bull's Hill or Phipps's Hill, or maybe even Greenwood's Hill after previous owners. Now it is named Scudder's Hill after a Dr. Scudder who lived at the Greenwood house in the 1920s. Jonas Greenwood moved here after selling some of his farm to John Grout and his son Jonas Jr. would later build the house next door. In 
Several of the Greenwoods fought in the Revolutionary War, later settling in Dublin, New Hampshire, then almost a colony of Sherman people. Most roads kept to the high ground. To avoid Dirty Meadow Swamp, the county road turned off Washington Street here and continued down Greenwood Street, jogged right onto Woodland Street, very shortly afterward turned left on Ash Lane and finally turned right again on Hollis Street to get to East Holliston. Greenwood Street has changed less than many of the sections of the county road. The section of Washington Street through the swamp would not be built until about 1830. Even in the early, early 1900s, it was a narrow rutted section as shown here. At Ash Lane and Woodland Street, what looks like an old dam actually is the causeway used to cross Dirty Meadow Brook. All roads were dirt and almost impassable in spring mud season, especially if the ground was a bit low and swampy. For that reason, the roadway probably went from here toward Hollis Street along the top of the Escarth. Now it has been shifted somewhat down the slope with areas filled in with gravel from a nearby borrow pit. George's coach would have crossed the causeway at its narrow bridge and continued down Ash Lane. Most of the roads in Sherwood were officially accepted by the selectmen in 1683, but when George rode through, the only one that had an official name was the county road. All others in Sherwood had to wait until 1907. Until then, they were generally described as the road to so-and-so's house, the road to the farm, and the road to Ashland, etc. Much of the land from here to Holliston had originally been owned by John Hull, merchant and mint master of the Pine Tree Shilling, then passed to Judge Samuel Sewell and his heirs, and finally was sold to Addington Gardner. Gardner's house, enlarged around a much earlier one, dates to about 1730, and is the only house George would have seen between Jonas Greenwood's house and ones in Holliston. Addington Gardner's son, Aaron, had served in the French and Indian Wars and later became an officer in the Revolutionary War. Another son, Caleb, fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill. From here, George Washington continued on down Hollis Street to where the street as Holliston's Whitney Street joins the present Route 16 in East Holliston. And Joanne Hulbert will take on for Holliston. Holliston in 1789. George Washington would have seen Holliston on a map that looks nothing like the shape of present day Holliston as you can notice, and keep that in mind because it will come up again in conversation. Here is where in the present town of Holliston is to be found in that old map, someplace within it. Holliston once stretched from its north boundary with Framingham all the way southwest toward Bellingham. At the time, Holliston shared Lake Winthrop with Medway, for instance, only after several land swaps and the land taken for the incorporation of Ashland. Not until 1850 would Holliston's more familiar form appear on a map. Proceeding beyond the town of Sherbin, George Washington would emerge onto the road that we later named in his honor. Upon that road, he found encouraging signs of growth and prosperity. Older houses were being joined by newer ones. The Whiting family homestead built about 1750 encompassed a large swath of land, some of which has passed recently from farmland to 21st century construction. Several generations of the Whiting family lived in East Holliston, from Samuel to David to Nathan, who could not keep his son George, born in 1840, down on the farm, as young George had musical talent recognized in Hollison, which sent him to New York City, where he became a prominent composer of organ music. <laughs> 
just a few steps beyond stands the Benjamin Batchelder House built in 1788. It would have appeared new and reflected the optimistic local economy that Holliston's residents enjoyed after the Revolutionary War. Washington was making his trip around the, the new American states to see for himself what the new American citizens and how they were faring. This house and others like it that he saw along the way were much welcomed signs of local prosperity. Ah, the elms. As, Na as Nathaniel Philbrook wrote in Travels in jo with George, several towns had majestic elms that were said to have been admired by Washington as he traveled along the way. And yes, Arthur Philbrick outed Holliston as one of those towns, along with Billerica and Wellesley. Our local tradition stated that George Washington rested under the shade of the trees and partook of refreshment from the hostelry nearby. While rumor has it that George stopped at any hostelry or tavern that served refreshments, we must point out that resting under the shade of the trees is unlikely. Since George traveled through Holliston in November and not much in the way of shade would be found at the time of year. Also, history records that the trees were planted sometime between 1747 and 1751, so that trees, even of the, maj the, maj the maj majesty of elms, might not impress any passersby, especially during the month of November. The Simeon Newton House, built circa 1727, uh, that date had once decorated the chimney years ago, Newton's home, built as it is on a slope, was not your typical agricultural land. The inventory list after Simeon died in 1801 included Cooper's tools and timber, a press for cheese, cider and vinegar, and two cows. Holliston, like all towns, had many inhabitants who were mechanics those who worked with tools instead of relying only on farming. The Alden Leland House built circa 1780 is located on Church Place. The history of the house tells a story of a typical 18th century house of hip roof colonial style that suffered neglect and was ignored by homeowners who considered the style oh so obsolete and so old fashioned. The house once stood on the main road just below where the house now stands. But luckily, in that era, houses were just as likely to be moved as they were to be torn down. A subsequent owner of the house, wanting to simply, somehow, move the house up the incline, and presto, the site was cleared away for a new 19th century new home. And a short distance down the main road, just beyond the town center of Holliston, still comfortably resides the Oliver Leland House, circa 1790. Oliver's hip roofed house was also moved. The house once stood where two Victorian houses next door now occupy that prominent location along the road that came to be called Washington. And now Washington's entourage would travel up the road, up Phipps Hill, as it is known today. And when they crossed over Chicken Brook near present day Underwood Street, they then crossed over into present day, uh, the past day border of the town of Medway. A short distance of only about a quarter mile, the road curved to the right and then re-entered into Holliston again. For a brief moment, George Washington may not have literally stepped his foot in Medway, but certainly his horse's hoofs did. The Jonathan Cutler House at 1380 Washington Street, which would be the first house that he would re-enter into Holliston by, was built circa 1730. This part of the present day structure existed back in 1789, although it was not recorded that they stopped here for refreshments nor for rest. Many others in history have stopped here and were still stopping even many years after the revolution. George, um, uh, George also did not sleep here, but since the house was located right along the old Pout Lane, that Native American pathway that meandered from South Natick through Sherbin and Holliston and beyond, 
Occasionally groups of traveling Native Americans would stop by as darkness obscured the way. They settled upon the floor of the house, sleeping the night away, obligating the house residents to retreat to the upper loft until morning when they quietly continued on their way along the path to locations west towards Menden and Grafton and beyond. This was not an unusual accommodation between the colonial residents and the Native Americans who were very much still here. Ah. Ephraim Littlefield's Tavern. The location features Hollison's greatest connection to George Washington and enjoys the most documented history we have of Washington's visit to Holliston. Here, certainly, afforded the entourage along that indifferent road everything they required, refreshment, a chance to stretch weary legs, and a brook right by the door for the horse's liquid pleasures and relief as well. Legend says that Washington never passed by a tavern, and Littlefields has entered history as one of those stops. A pewter cup, said to have been used by George was handed down to the Hollison Historical Society as a relic of that occasion. The Balancing Rock, now out of balance as of September, 2020, perhaps the refreshing hiatus at the tavern set George in a lighter mood. As they approached the glacial erratic, who might have suggested that George attempt to topple it? No one knows, but the story has been passed down through many generations and still remains one of Hollison's enduring legends. Over the centuries, many people have stopped by and attempted to topple the boulder. Once again, nature wins. Now, what was ahead for George and his entourage? He still had quite a journey to complete before he crossed over the Massachusetts state line into Connecticut. This is a route you can still follow today. Route 16, known along the way of its miles as Washington streets, continue through Milford, Menden, Uxbridge, and Douglas. The George Washington Presidential Trail was created in 1989 as an act of the Massachusetts legislature to commemorate Washington's trip on November 6, 1789 through the Blackstone Valley. Although the act only designates a three quarter mile long section of Route 16 in Menden, the trail and signs were extended five miles down East Hartford Avenue into Uxbridge. Further on, as Hartford Avenue continues west, the road rejoins Route 16 in Menden, uh, in, in Uxbridge, sorry, no, in Douglas, sorry, in Douglas, and makes a sharp turn towards Webster. But do not go that way. Stay straight ahead on the road that appears indifferent and less traveled, and soon you will cross over into East Thompson, Connecticut. You will have also avoided traveling into Rhode Island, just as George intended. Yeah, now I turn it back to uh, Terry uh, with the uh, Natick Historical Society, and we will continue from there. Thank you, Joanne. George Washington would returned back to New York a week after passing through here. He returned to New England the following year to visit Rhode Island, which by then had ratified the Constitution. But he did never manage to get back to Vermont or travel again on the indifferent road. Thank you for joining us. I will pass you back to our host, Nikki. Thank you, Terry, Joanne, and Betsy. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you also to Liz Anderson working the slides and a warm but silent Zoom round of applause for all of you. Um, this has been a, a wonderful program. And um, as you can see on the screen now, we're sharing some resources for you to continue uh, learning about George Washington um, after this presentation concludes. And um, We'll make sure to send that to you uh, in an email following the program. So keep an eye out for that. Before uh, we begin our conversation, our question and answer period, I want to offer thanks again to our supporters of, of all four organizations. Um, it's really your generosity that makes it possible for us to offer 
uh, programs like this one uh, for free to all in our communities. So if you've enjoyed this program, then I encourage you to look up your local historical society or your local library and uh, find out how you can get involved and uh, consider making uh, a contribution. Um, I, I've had a couple of questions come in while the program was running. Um, the first of which, um, everybody's favorite figure from, uh, from the early Republic, Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> was Alexander Hamilton uh, with George at any point on his journey through our town? And, and uh, Terry, go ahead. Thank you. Actually, no, he was, he was one of the ones holding down the fort in New York. Uh, when Washington went on the trip, and that was a very specific decision. Okay, okay. So no Hamilton, but we did get Washington. We have a question here about sort of what was Washington's tour like, if anybody could comment on that. On that. Was, were the roads sort of thronged with um, cheering, uh, cheering uh, new citizens of the Republic, or um, does anybody have a sense of that? That um, Terry, go ahead. Um, um, when, when Washington came uh, to Boston, he'd heard when he was, I think, in Spencer that they were planning a big parade in his honor. And there was, in fact, a tumultuous parade. Um, there were, there were um, it was organized with the different trades were carrying white, these white banners uh, with, with the names of their trade. And they were all in alphabetical order. The Mass Historical Society actually has um, one of those, has at least one of those banners. Um, you saw the triumphal arch that, um, that was awaiting at the old state house. And actually there's reference made to the fact that Washington is reading some of the inscriptions on the arch and um, passed his hand across the eye, his eyes. I think he was not someone who was comfortable with praise and he seemed um, to, to react to that. But he visited um, um, a, a duck cloth, a sail cloth manufactory in Boston. Um, he went to see something that made it made cards for carding wool, a factory near the on, on the edge of the mill pond, what was then the mill pond. Um, he attended a, a banquet in his honor at Faneuil Hall. Uh, he actually went on an exercise in Boston Harbor uh, as a uh, uh, guest of the French who, who uh, had a vessel, a military vessel in the harbor at the time, and, and much more. Uh, so. Well, that's wonderful. Well, and, and I think, um, so we have a number of questions coming in here. Also, a lot of gratitude um, from people who are really excited to see some properties in a, in a new light. Um, so thanks to our speakers. Uh, for that. I have another question here about uh, staying overnight. Did the president stay overnight uh, anywhere locally on this trip uh, that, we're, that we're aware of? I'm seeing, Joanne, do you want to? Yeah, uh, no, he didn't. He, he went straight through the area. It was daytime. And his next stop was in North Uxbridge. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, sometime we'll have to pull them in on this loop of what Washington <laughs> did when he came came through our area. Um, I see here a question about the Littlefield Tavern. Um, is that a private residence now? That is a private residence. If you um, knock on the door looking for the tavern, the tavern is long gone and you will not be invited in for a drink, I don't think. <laughs> okay, it good to know. Residence, yeah. <laughs> no knocking on the tavern door. No knocking on the tavern door, right. <laughs> got it, got it. Um, so what about, this is sort of back to Washington's entourage. Um, does anyone have a sense, uh, uh, Terry, perhaps for you, um, did Washington have any kind of security? Um, the short answer is no. He really had, so he was in the carriage on his own, and then his, his two secretaries, uh, Tobias Lear and William Jackson, literally were riding horses on either side of it. So I suppose in that sense, his private secretaries were more or less serving as, as whatever security there would have been. Um, it was considering that he was the, the first president, it was, it was considered by many to have been a pretty modest entourage. Okay, how times have changed, right? Um, I, I'm also getting- Well, no, nobody was out gunning for him. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, a, a happy new republic. Um, 
I, I'm I'm getting a number of questions here about Natick that I'm going to tie together. Um, one is um, sort of uh, Terry. Can you talk about uh, the Elliot Meeting House? Of course, was was not in your talk, um, and 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 why is that? And uh, was Elliot alive during Washington's visit? Did he interact with um, any of the uh, Native people in the area? Um, thank you. No, um, I, I mentioned it, I think, just briefly when I was speaking about the burying ground. Mm -hmm. The meeting house he would have um, ridden past was the one built in 1767, which at that point was the fourth one on the site. John Elliott died in 1690. So the original meeting house um, would have been long gone. The meeting house that you see there today is actually the fifth one on the site. It was built, built in 1828. So it, the, the one that stands there now would not have been went there when Washington passed. Um, there is no indication of, um, of any, any interaction actually with anyone. There, there, are, there are rumors and legends that involve um, elm trees as um, Joanne noted. Um, but we haven't had anything that validates that he kind of stopped to speak to anyone when he passed through. Okay. Well, except the story in Sherman that he stopped and spoke to Asa Sanger. And then the question is, did Asa know ahead of time that George was coming? And was that why he was out working on his stone wall, sort of waiting for George? Or was that totally coincidental? And we'll never know. Um, Actually, Betsy, this brings us to another question, um, which is how did how did sort of the average person living uh, in the area know if that George Washington was coming through, or did they know? Um, and and I'm actually thinking of the snowstorm here, but yeah, go Betsy, I'm seeing you. No, I'm not sure they knew from something that Terry said. You know, when he changed his plans, communication was so poor that I don't think people would have gone ahead alerting anybody. I think he just got in his coach and went. But we have no record of anything about George other than this, the Sanger teacups and Asa's conversation. There's nothing else that got into any of the Sherman records that I'm aware of. Nathaniel Philbrick um, in his book indicates that there was really no advance warning because it wasn't originally planned. It was a more or less a last minute change. There was, Joanne, maybe you can bear me out. I don't know if it was Uxbridge or what. There was some tavern out in that direction where he was going to stop, I think for the night. And the tavern keeper was out doing something and his, and his barmaid or some said, oh, he's not here, you have to go away. And so George went off. The tavern keeper then went running after him, trying to get him to come back, and George wouldn't come back. So he did. Obviously, that tavern keeper didn't know. That, that's right. It was either the daughter. It was a whoever was tending the door at that time, and it was not the the uh, head tavern keeper. And uh, it, it, I guess there was a, a rider that would go ahead, kind of like to see what the road was going to look like ahead, and maybe finding a place to stop. And that happened in Menden. And he uh, the, knocked on the door and everything. And the, um, the writer said that, uh, that the president was coming. And uh, the girl who uh, received that message uh, sa uh, said, no, 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 we don't, we, no, no, no place. We don't have enough place accommodations for tonight. And when she was asked about it later, she said, oh, I, I thought that they meant the president of Harvard was coming through. And so she had no interest in getting things uh, prepared for that. And so uh, they had to ride on to look for another spot and it ended up in Uxbridge. <laughs> so <laughs> they amended lost their big chance uh, to uh, be where <laughs> Washington slept. Uh, so I guess I suppose instead they atoned for that fact by getting that uh, 1981 legislature, uh, the signs that they could put up um, I, I did run that route actually in my car just to see uh, if I could find any uh, evidence of that. Uh, I don't think the signs are up anymore. I could not find any of the signs that uh, that they had for that three quarter mile. Um, but <laughs> but when you go off onto the Hartford Ave part of Menden into Uxbridge, it you will see a lot of old houses along the way and also some great views. I, I would recommend anybody who would like to do a little Sunday ride to follow that route. And you will then see exactly what George Washington saw along that stretch. <laughs>
Uh, he didn't get to stay in Men Menden though. <laughs> oh, that's, that's wonderful. Um, Joanne, uh, another question while we're in, uh, in Holliston here, um, a question about whether we know if George Washington made any orders uh, for his men to also attempt pushing the rock over. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently George Washington uh, uh, took took that job on all by himself and perhaps he had a good audience watching him including his secretary uh, and other members of his entourage uh, it does question bring up the question though just what was he served at Littlefield Tavern before he headed for that <laughs> right <laughs> although the rumor has it that um uh, Littlefield, the, the uh, tavern keeper uh, was uh, apparently accused often for watering down the rum but I don't know. Maybe that's just a rumor. <laughs> he'd, also, he'd also been a Tory, hadn't he? Well, yes, his son, El, um, uh, Ephraim Littlefield Jr., and plus and others, because Littlefield Tavern during or early on in the war uh, was the hangout for the Tory element in Hollis, and that is correct. Yes, we must uh, confess to that. Although... Um, Eli, uh, Eliel Littlefield uh, Jr. also, and along with Ephraim and several others that were accused of that, they were on, un, under house arrest during the war, uh, did write letters to the selectmen of Holliston saying, uh, denying that they were Tories. And several of them did actually uh, serve a little time in the militia groups. So uh, perhaps uh, they have atoned for that. Uh, but I do expect that George was greeted very nicely by. Mr. Littlefield, uh, all that we have seen and all that has been written and passed down uh, states that he was a cordial, uh, cordial person when he came to, the, came to his door. So uh, uh, I don't think that there were any uh, bad feelings that were translated out of there. So okay. I think that it speaks well for Mr. Littlefield. <laughs> Holliston was well represented then to George and, and his party. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> yes. Um, so we have we have a question here about uh, the name Washington Street, um, and and maybe a question for all three of you. Sort of, um, it's is it it's named Washington Street in multiple towns, save one of ours featured in in this talk. Um, how far back toward Boston does that name change go, or to the west? Um, I think we're looking for any kind of context on on that on that name change. Um, do you um, who who would like to to jump in here? I think probably everybody's got a got something to say about this. Um, ter Terry, go just, ahead. Just to note that it 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 more or less starts, I believe, at Water from Watertown. Uh, I don't know when the different street names were changed, and no, um, Natick is the one standout that kept Elliott Street and didn't change it to Washington. But I think it traced really a lot of the route of um, November 6th. Interestingly, in Boston, where the old neck, the old Boston neck, the narrow part of the, of the peninsula, lower Washington Street, had been renamed by the time he had arrived in, in 1789. So when he came to Boston, he was actually greeted by a, by a section of street that had been named for him. That's wonderful. That, that's you know, I don't know when Sherburn's Washington Street got that name. I don't think it was named in 1907. I'll have to check, which may mean that it got it later or even earlier. I don't know when it ceased being called the County Road. All right. Um, another great research question. And, and Joanne, any, any context on Holliston? Uh, yes, Holliston started naming their streets in 1857. So that would have been at that time. Now there is a bit of road in uh, Milford that is, and I'm not sure beyond that point if there's any more Washington streets on there. Um, I think there might be, uh, but uh, I know that you know the main stretch going in uh, Menden and Uxbridge was actually you know, East Hartford Avenue and West Hartford Avenue. And I'm not sure what the street is in uh, Douglas. I'm not sure if there's a stretch in there of that, but um, I know that certainly it seems to have been a trend going through Wellesley and Sherbin and Holliston, and we we have retained it. 
we noticed <laughs> and we we did commemorate it. So I, I think I'll offer another warm but silent Zoom round of applause to our speakers, um, Betsy Johnson, Joanne Hulbert, and Terry Evans. Um, and a thanks also to Liz Anderson over at the Sherburn Library. Um, we're grateful to all of you for putting this presentation together and um, thank you to all. Lovely to see everybody.